standing by. Morning, good morning, all of the young girls of Rodine School for Young Girls in Parktown, Johannesburg. It's a wonderful, wonderful morning here in the Kruger National Park, and it's great to have you with us. Also joining us, Mr. Brian Joffe, ex Bidvest. Lovely to have you with us too, sir. We're hoping to find you some cats. We know you're a giant cat fan. Unfortunately, we haven't found any cats yet, but hopefully over the course of the next 45 minutes, we will. Now, kids, my name is James. On camera today is David. That's David's thumb, everyone. And also driving an old girl of Rodine, Jamie Patterson. And she is driving around just off behind where you're sitting now, and she will hopefully find something as well. Please ask us any questions you want as we go along the drive. Your teachers will send us through some messages, and we will happily, happily answer them for you. So welcome to it. Let's see what we can find. We came into this area because there are tracks of a female leopard and her little baby cubs. And I don't know how many of you have been watching over the last few days, but we've spent some time with her. She's a 12-year-old female leopard, and her cubs, as of tomorrow, will be five months old. So they're very small. They're about that big at the moment, just bigger than, say, a Scottish terrier. I'm not sure if you know what that is. About the size of a, um, a French bulldog, if you like. That's about their size. Now, now, what we're going to do is just drive gently around here and see if we can't pick up the little buns. And we're looking into the trees. We're hoping to see maybe a little bit of white tail hanging from the trees. And it's got quite hot now. And so we're looking right into the deep shade to see if we can't find the golden and white spots. Now, you, I want you to look very carefully everywhere we drive because you can drive past a leopard so easily and not know that it's there. We need to listen out for birds, birds alarm call, especially a bird called the rattling cysticula. It goes And when it sees a leopard, and then everything, all the animals, all the impala and the diker and the steenbok, they all go, oh, what's there? And they're very worried because, of course, nobody, if you are not a leopard, wants to see a leopard. We like to see leopards, but none of the other animals out here do, because leopards are predators. So we also watch out for fork-tailed drongos. They're special birds. Oh, I've just spotted a very special bird. And I'm going to see if David's got his good eyes on or if he's got his bad eyes on today. David, in this biggest tree that you can see in front of us, it's flown away. There was a woodpecker, everybody. You remember what a woodpecker is? You know what a woodpecker is? It goes peck, 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 peck on the branches of trees and it digs out worms. It eats grubs, which are very delicious for woodpeckers, not so delicious for us as human beings. Now, we know also that leopards love these kind of areas. You see what we're sitting on now? This is called a drainage line, and basically that means it's a dry stream. So if I was a leopard, I'd probably be walking up there if I was hunting. Otherwise, I'd find some nice shade to lie in, and maybe that's where the leopard is. We're going to drive around here and see if we're not very lucky and we don't find Karula the Queen and her little babies. Also out on drive today is Steph. And Steph, oh, I've lost my, my communications. Steph is on foot, and he's finding us the little things of the bush with Herbert and with Viam. Let's head across to Jamie, find out what's going on with her. Hello, and welcome on the back of our safari vehicle. So I remember when we spoke a couple of days ago about how when you went out on safari, you've got to imagine like you're sitting on the back of the car with us. And I know that lots of you put your hands up when we asked how many of you had been on safari. But if you missed that visit by Brent and myself, my name is Jamie, and behind me sits a man called Brian. And a very special character called the Thumb. If you pay close attention, you never know when the Thumb might pop up and say hello, and how many of you just spotted him. Now Brian handles the camera. He's a bit shy, so he stays quiet behind us. Sometimes he might speak to us. 
but we're heading out and we're going to show you all kinds of wonderful things on your safari journey. Now we've been looking for some really special animals and that was the buffalo that we saw this morning. So we saw a brand new buffalo calf, really, really tiny, still wet from mom and struggling to stand up on its feet. And we watched for hours and hours waiting for it to get up. And I've just come back to where we left it and it's gone away, which is actually really good news because it means that mom got up and led the buffalo calf a little bit towards safety. Because when you're a baby buffalo or a baby antelope or any of the other baby species, you've got to be really careful and up on your feet as quickly as possible. Otherwise, the predators might decide to come and get you. Now, Eden, you were wondering on the subject of safety, if an animal comes close to us because it wants to eat us, what must we do? And the answer is, the animals never really come close to us because they don't, we're not on their menu. Human beings are not on their menu, even if it's a big lion. They are so used to the vehicles driving around them, and it's not in their natural instinct. We're not like a buffalo or an antelope. We're not something that they want to hunt and kill. And all of them in this particular area, so we're in a magical place called the Sabi Sand, and all of them have grown up their entire lives with safari vehicles driving around them. So we're kind of almost like another tree or a rock or something similar. So they basically just ignore us. But in the very, very unusual situation, say an animal's really thin and hungry or upset in some way, it's really important for us to remember that we are in their home. So if we're watching, we're always reading the animal's body language because that's the way that the animals talk to us. That's the way that they communicate how they're feeling. So we're always watching, always making sure that we're looking at what it is they're showing us and telling us and then we move away. And you move out of their space and you find yourself a nice spot elsewhere. Now, I've got a really special surprise up my sleeve because there's some big animals hiding away that are capable, very, very capable, of causing a human being and a vehicle injury. Now, I'm not gonna tell you what they are just yet. We're gonna slowly creep around. But Kaya, you're wondering if anybody in the Sabi Sands has ever been hurt by an animal. And yes, yes, absolutely they have, but it's very, very unusual, so it hardly ever, ever happens. Sorry, Tyre, it's Tyre. You were wondering about whether or not anyone's been hurt. It does happen. Every now and again, let's say you're walking and the wind is blowing and something catches you by surprise. But because we're really careful, it's very unusual. Hardly ever happens. And we make sure that we're watching what the animal's doing at all times. So while I sneak up on your special surprise, let's go across to the really funny Mr. Henry, who's got another big animal. Ooh, that sounds very exciting. Jamie's got a special surprise. Well, here's my surprise for you. It's a buffalo. Great big cape buffalo. And on its face is a very special kind of a bird. Now, we made the noise, remember, of the rattling sisticola going pee, 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 pee. Well, this bird, which is called a red-billed oxpecker, red-billed oxpecker, and that's because he's got a red beak. See, he's got a bright red beak there. He also has an alarm call that we have to listen to when we're walking on foot. We listen to it very carefully because when the, you hear the oxpecker going bzz, 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 you know that there could be a buffalo or a rhino or an impala or something close by, but you don't want to walk into a buffalo like this because they don't really like us when we're walking on foot because they're very scared of us. He's a huge fellow. Now, you've all seen cows before, and he's about twice the size of a cow. Martina, you want to know why it is that baby buffaloes cannot stand up when they're first born. Well, Martina, how long do you think it took you to stand up when you were first born? You know, it probably took you about uh, a year, 12 months, 52 weeks. So it's just because when th little mammals are born, their muscles and their bones and their nerves, they don't work quite properly yet, and it takes a little while for them to start to work. But buffalo will stand up within half an hour of being born. 
So what takes us as human beings 12 months to do, it takes a buffalo only half an hour, which I think is quite impressive. So although they can't stand when they're born, they can stand very, very soon after they're born. It's a very good question. And Lara, you want to know how big that buffalo is and how big they can get. Now, how, there are how many of you in your classroom? I'm going to guess at roughly 20. You all probably weigh between 20 and 25 kilograms, right? That, let's say they're 25 kilograms, that means in 100 kilograms you're going to find four of you. Now these things weigh 800 kilograms. Now do you, I don't think you've done your times tables yet, but you will soon. 8 times 4 is 24. That means that everybody in your classroom, if you were to put you all on one scale, you would weigh the same as one of these big buffaloes. Isn't that amazing? I think that's absolutely incredible. In fact, I've counted up. My multiplication is bad. 32 of you is what I meant. 8 times 4 is 32, and it would take 32 little Rodine grade 1s to make up one big buffalo of 800 kilograms. Isn't that amazing? I think that's pretty impressive. And this bird, let's have a look back, look at our little bird, and he's eating ticks. We all know what ticks are. Ticks are those nasty things that suck the blood out of animals. So that buff buffalo is being helped by the oxpecker as he eats ticks out of the buffalo's ear. Ew. All right, let's head across to my friend Steph. He's walking on foot, which is, of course, the best way to experience the wilderness. That's absolutely right, everybody. I'm on foot. I'm in the middle of the same game reserve that, that James and Jamie are busy driving around in. We try to avoid all the big stuff. Of course, we don't really get stepped on. But what I do really enjoy looking at is all the small stuff. And right here, we've got... Oopsie daisy. Well, as you can imagine, sometimes bringing you something live from the middle of the African bush brings with it a challenge every now and again. So Steph disappeared, but I'm still here, and here is your special surprise that I told you I had planned. So I saw them from quite a way back, but I just wanted to approach them nice and slowly. Now, we were speaking before about animals hurting people, and it's very important, as I said, to remember that we're in their home. And these big elephants weigh far more than I do, far more than all of you do, and far more than Brian, myself, and the car that we call Wendy. Oh, look at that. Isn't that incredible? We've come across them. This is the other reason why I wanted to be so quiet. Look at that. It's sleeping. The elephant is fast asleep, lying completely flat. Now, how many of you knew that elephants, even when they're adults, can lie down to sleep? Hands up if you knew that. Because a lot of people don't believe that something that big can actually lie down. But there the elephant is fast asleep. Now have a look while we watch the elephant sleeping. See how the leaves are blowing in the wind? Now on windy days like today, animals like elephants, buffalo that you saw with James, all of the antelope like impala and inyala, they get really, really nervous. And that's because elephants animals eyesight isn't as good as ours they rely much more on listening and smelling so how many of you think that you've got a really good sense of smell because every animal here has a better sense of smell than we can even imagine imagine being able to almost almost like see where somebody had walked just by using your nose following their scent trail that's what animals can do and that's why they don't like these windy days makes them a little bit upset. But we're very lucky because as you can see that elephant's fast asleep. The rest of them are happily feeding all around us and nobody is showing any signs of being unhappy. I told you about how we look at the animal's body language. That's what we're doing now. Here's a big male. He's not that big. Let me say, let me call him a young male, but he is an adult male elephant. And he's standing a little bit away from the rest of the herd. And that's because elephant males, when they're grown up, when they become adults, they actually leave the safety of the herd 
and they move away and they live either on their own or with other young boys kind of like students getting a flat together they stay with young boys and then they grow up and they become adults and they lead lives that are pretty much solitary so all on their own until they come and meet up with a herd of elephants like this just for a little bit of company now at the moment our A's are relatively sleepy. Hello, boy. What's the matter? It's okay. Why are you so upset? It's all right. See how he's showing me how big and scary he is, making his ears nice and wide? Just because he's making sure that we know that he's bigger than he, he is bigger than we are, and he's watching us. Most of the other elephants aren't worried about us at all. In fact, most of them are feeding. And Tyre, you were wondering what an elephant eats. And the answer is, an elephant is a complete vegetarian. So they own, or a herbivore. So they only eat the leaves of trees, the bark of trees, sometimes the wood, and grass. And if you're really lucky, how funny is this? But if you're really lucky, you might even see an elephant eating mud. Can you believe it? The mud, like you see in the playground when it rains, an elephant might just eat that if they decide that they want some of the minerals from it. And the rest of the elephants are feeding in front of us. Now, Emily, <laughs> welcome to our special safari. You want to know if there are any baby elephants around. And yes, there are. There's one that's hiding with this female on the right. So the one that Brian's showing you there, if you look really, really carefully, Brian's going to help you. Have you spotted it yet? I know it's really hard to see, but there's a baby elephant. There he's moving. Can you see him? Just a little bit of movement, little ears flapping. Now we can actually get a little bit closer now, maybe see if we can't get a different view of this baby elephant, because baby elephants are one of my favorite things to see. And you know why? because baby elephants like to play. They're really playful, particularly the little boys, but the little girls as well. And sometimes they even come up and entertain themselves by pretending to be big and scary and trying to chase us away. They're very special animals, elephants. That being said, you never want to underestimate them. I mentioned how big they are. Isabella, you want to know how fast they are. So we spoke, when I was there last, we spoke about how fast a cheetah can move and how fast a leopard can move. Now, an elephant might look big and clumsy, but the truth is they're really not. And when an elephant wants to run, an elephant wants to run, it can cover 15 meters in one second. So when you go outside after your lessons, when it's lunchtime, take 15 big steps and mark out the distance so mark out 15 meters and then just imagine being able to run that in 15 seconds oh sorry not in 15 seconds in one second try it see if any of you can and i bet you can't elephants are super super quick when they want to but that makes sense some of you are taller some of you are shorter and those of you who are tall can walk really fast Elephants have really, really long legs, so they cover ground quickly. Oh, Mom is leading the rest of the herd away into some thicker vegetation. Diana, you want to know how elephants attack other animals if they're so big and slow looking. The elephants, the nice thing about elephants is that they hardly ever do attack anything else. Sometimes it happens, particularly now. Many, you should all know that we are struggling for rain in South Africa at the moment which means for these animals there's very little water for them to drink. And what that means is sometimes the elephants chase away the other animals from the water holes. They also chase lions and leopards and wild dogs just because I don't think they smell very nice and an elephant has a very sensitive sense of smell. So Diana, they run really quickly with those long, long legs. So an elephant's leg, you guys saw how tall I am when I came to visit the other day. An elephant's leg, just its leg, is taller than I am. Maybe as tall as Brent, because Brent's pretty tall. 
Now, can you imagine how many, how long their strides can be when they choose to run? That's how an elephant moves so quickly. Also, things like a tree that we might have to go around, let's say, let's take this little bush that's off to our left here. Not a big tree. It's called a magic worry bush. But something like that for an elephant is not even an obstacle. The elephant, if it wants to, if it's really cross or really, really scared, it's just going to run straight over the top of it, just push the tree down and run. So they don't have to worry too much about obstacles. I think let's try and catch up with our other elephants, see what they're doing. Let's see what the sleeping one's doing. Because when last did you get to see an elephant sleeping so happily on the ground? Let's go investigate. I'm going to try and just roll forward so that we don't wake it up. Oh, lots of sleepy ellies. All the sleepy ellies. Whoopsie. It's okay. All right, girl. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I said we were going to try and roll forward, but the wind's making them upset. So they're all up and about. Hello, guys. Sorry, didn't mean to scare you. It's okay. So see, now the elephants are talking to us. They're watching us really carefully. And they're telling us something. They're telling us, hey, we didn't smell you coming. We didn't hear you because you didn't turn on your car engine. And we actually got a little bit of a fright. So now we're watching you carefully because we want to decide what you're doing. So I'm not whispering too much because I just want to let them know that we are here. Hello, guys. It's okay. It's all right. I'm sorry. Didn't mean to scare you. It's okay. See, remember when I told you about it being windy? There's a little baby at the back, and that's also why they're being so protective, because they want to make sure that they keep the youngsters safe. Now, while we watch them walk away, Mayabi, you were wondering, why does an elephant have such a long nose? Why does an elephant have a trunk? It's this really amazing thing, because there's no other animal that has something as unique as an elephant's trunk. It can be strong enough to pull off big branches and at the same time gentle enough to pick up the tiniest of twigs or even just gently touch a baby to calm it down. So Maya B, it's because one of the big reasons is because elephants are so very tall and they've evolved to use a trunk to reach down to the grass that they want to eat, to the water that they want to drink anything like that. Okay, girl. All right. So what's happening now is we're going to move backwards a little bit. And I'll tell you why. So I said that elephants talk to us. It's just up to, up to us to understand what they're telling us. So she's telling me to go away. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give them a bit more space. And while we do that, over to James with one very fluffy antelope. Yes, indeed, everybody, a fluffy antelope, and you know it's nice to be fluffy in the winter time. These are waterbuck. One young bull, he's the one on the right-hand side. See these little horns? They will eventually be big horns, and I'm going to ask your teacher to draw for you a rapier. A rapier is a kind of a sword, and that's what those tiny little horns there now are going to look like when he's a big adult daddy waterbuck. Look at him. Now, the thing about a waterbuck, of course, is that his nose is shaped like a heart. You see that? And they've got very fluffy fur, which is lovely for the winter. It's not so good for the summer because it's very hot out here in the summertime. But it's actually quite thin. So although it's fluffy and long, it's not very thick hair. Isn't that nice? And then just to the other side is his mum. There's his mum, and she's just lying down, and if you watch her, ooh, you see they get a little bit nervous. You know why they're nervous? They're nervous because the wind is blowing, and that means it's very difficult for them to smell or hear 
anything that might want to come and eat them. And we know that there are leopards around here, lions, wild dogs, hyenas, all sorts of creatures that might want to eat a water buck. Now, just up ahead here, we've got some impala. And I'm sure that many of you have been to the Kruger Park before, or maybe to Pilansburg or to the Waterberg, and you would have seen impala before. But let's have a look at them. They're the most common antelope we get here, but they're very, very beautiful. I'm just going to move up a little bit further forward so that David can get a good picture of them. There we go. Lara, you are a very clever young lady, clearly. You've asked why are they called waterbuck. Well, Lara, they're called waterbuck because normally what happens is when they are frightened by a predator, now a predator is something like a lion or a leopard or a hyena, they will run into the water. And we know, you know, if you've got a house cat, they don't like swimming much, do they? And so the cats will normally leave the water buck alone if it runs into the water. Now, they don't always do that because there's not a whole lot of water around here, especially in the winter time. You know that it doesn't rain in Johannesburg in the winter time, it's just very cold. And it's the same here, it doesn't get as cold as Johannesburg, but we don't get any rain in the winter time. So those water buck can't really run into the water, but that's where they get their name from. Now these impala are very, very clever because they can eat leaves from trees and grass at the same time. And that's why in so many areas you see so many impala, more than you see any other animal. You see lots and lots of impala. There's a little one and they all live in a big group of females and little ones and then the males the big rams are just off to one side now did you know that you call a female impala a u a male impala is a ram and a baby one is a lamb and you all know of course that that's the same as it is for sheep Oh, something very, very special here. In the winter time, Steph has found a snake. Welcome back. You've come back to the bushwalk. And guess what we found? Just around the corner of my finger is a marbled tree snake. Have a look at that. Now I know it's a marble tree snake because of that fantastic pattern on the back of its head. And have a look at that dark brown body, that greyish speckled brown body, that's to hide it. It's a daytime snake, meaning that it sleeps at night and it hunts in the day. And this little snake's looking for lizards and is hunting up this tree because lizards in winter need to stay warm with the sun. And quite often lizards will climb into trees to hide and to get to that sun onto the exposed branches. And have a look at this little snake. Not poisonous for us, it has a mild venom, so nothing that's gonna do any damage to me. You definitely wouldn't find me doing this to a cobra or a black mamba, but this little guy, isn't it wonderful that we get to spend some time Now snakes, they've got no legs and they've got no arms. So you want to ask me, how do they climb trees? Snakes use their bodies and they use their skin to climb trees. Now what you need to do is take your arm and put it on your desk if you can, or on the floor, and push hard and try and move your arm on the floor. Try and do this on the desk and you'll see that your arm sticks. And the more of your arm you get on the floor, the more difficult it is to move it. And that's exactly what the snake does. It makes itself very flat on its tummy, pushes hard down onto a corner or onto an edge, and it uses that way to push itself up the tree. Isn't that amazing? Now I'm being quite sneaky because snakes are deaf. They can't hear me. And as long as I stay hidden, he won't see me. And if he doesn't see me, then they won't get scared and, and well, basically slither away and move out of shot for you. So as long as I stay hidden, the snake doesn't even know I'm here. And I can speak as loud as I want. Snakes are completely deaf. They sense their world around them using their eyes, using 
their taste and using their body to feel vibrations. Their whole body uses... Oh, almost got me there. I had to stay hidden there. Awesome, hey? All right. We're going to leave this little guy to carry on hunting for the lizards. And Jamie has got something much, much bigger to show you. Something much bigger and a lot less scaly. We're with a different herd of elephants. And we've... Oh! Did any of you hear that trumpeting? Off in the distance, the whole herd is just walking away from a waterhole. Uh, that female in the other elephant herd gave me a big head shake and basically told me that she wasn't going to attack me. It was nothing to do with that, but she just told me that, hey, I'm not happy with you being around me. Please go away. And so we did, because as I said, we're in their home. And there we go as they all walk across to the other side of the dried out dam. Eden? You were wondering how I could tell the elephant was angry rather than hot. And that's because you know how clever elephants are with their huge ears. We spoke about the fact that an elephant's ears is like an air conditioning unit or a fan. So they flap their ears when they're hot to help them cool down. Though the difference is an elephant doesn't really flap its ears back to forward when it's angry. It only really does that when it's hot. So it kind of wafts the air like a fan when it's hot but when it's angry its ears flap as part of a huge head shake so it's the elephant shaking its ears but it's when an elephant goes completely still when their tails go still when their ears stop moving and they're just watching you with their head up and their ears out that you know that they're not angry but they're watching you really really carefully to make sure that you don't do anything naughty and just reminding you that they're a lot bigger and a lot stronger than we are. Okay. Let's try and go around and see if we can't get a better view from the front of the elephant herd. Now, Tataya, you were wondering whether or not the elephants can hear me talking to them. So you watching the way that I was speaking to the elephants and just letting them know that we were there. So the elephants obviously don't understand the words that I'm saying. They don't speak English, they speak elephant. But they do understand tone. Just like they know when there's an angry trumpet that an elephant makes versus a low comforting rumble. So by me speaking to them in a low tone, gentle voice, making sure that it's not high pitched or screaming, and nice and soft but loud enough that they can hear me, then yes, they don't understand what I'm saying, but they understand my intention. And I always talk to elephants, and we all always talk to elephants. It's one thing that you'll find every single one of us as guides will do, is we'll talk to the elephants. And I've even heard a story about somebody singing to elephants to calm them down when they were really cross at night. He said he just switched off his car and started to sing the national anthem of all things to the elephants, and they calmed down. Now, I'm pretty sure that the way I sing, that wouldn't work, because the elephants would get angry and run away because I can't sing at all. But maybe some of you with your beautiful voices could sing softly and sweetly to an elephant. Right, let's try and go around them. Oh, hold on, before we go, here's another animal for us to show you. A wildebeest, or a gnu. That's a very funny word. The word gnu is a ridiculous name. I prefer wildebeest. And these are blue wildebeest that have come down for a drink. Now, although they look like cows, you mustn't get them confused. They're not cows. They're actually closer related to something like an Inyala or a Kudu or an Impala. They're antelope. They just kind of don't look like antelope, do they? And they happen to be one of my favorite antelope species to stop and look at. Everybody thinks they're ugly. I don't think they're ugly at all. And the way that their coat is shining in the sun, definitely not. So we only get the blue wildebeest out here. And they live in either small herds or, if they're a male, then they live all on their own, 
defending a territory. And what wildebeest do is the wildebeest males will compete for the best possible territory. And what do you think would be the best possible territory for a wildebeest? What should it include? What do they need? Well, grass is one thing because they're busy munching away now. So grass is something that makes for a good wildebeest territory. And water and some shade and protection from other predators. So that's what a wildebeest male looks for when he looks for a territory, kind of like somebody looking for a nice house. Wildebeest looks for the best territory, and he does that not just because it's a nice place for him to live, but the better his territory, the nicer the grass, the more water there is, the better his chances that the ladies are going to come and visit him. So the female wildebeest will come through the territory, the best territory that a male has. So off they go wandering into the distance and I think our elephants have almost done the same thing luckily for us there's a road that runs just along the other side so while our wildebeest disappear I think we should try and go and catch up with our elephants before the end of your safari journey and while we try and get around I believe that Steph who finds all of the best things when he's out on walk He's found something else with lots of legs. Oh dear, and it seems as though poor old Steph couldn't show you the animal that he wanted to show you with lots of legs. It looks as though he lost a little bit of signal there. But that's okay, because you're on the back of the vehicle we call Wendy. And we're about to go and find you a better view of those elephants. Now, how cold is it back in Joburg? I bet it's not, I bet it's colder than it is here, because we're in a t-shirt. Brian, are you hot yet? I'm very hot. I'm hot now. <laughs> so even though it's midwinter for us as well, it's nice and warm here in the Sabi Sands. But while I have a drink of water and get you the elephants back on your screen once again, let's find out what James is doing. We haven't found anything except look in front of us. We've just found these as you arrived, and they are male impala. Now, remember what I co told you a male impala was called? Can you remember? On the count of three, I want you to shout it out to your teacher. Here we go. One, two, three. Ram! Impala ram. Remember, that's different from something like a buffalo, and then we say it's a buffalo bull, or a buffalo cow, or a buffalo calf and that's just because they're much bigger. Now, you are asking apparently how you tell an animal from its footprint. Well, we're going to try and find you some tracks, but it's very windy today. And because it's so windy, that means the tracks are not very clear. But Maya B, you were asking apparently, and so what I'm going to do is try and find you some impala tracks. But the first thing I'm going to do is to tell you that you have all walked on the beach. I know that you've all been to the beach at some stage. Have you all been to the beach? And you know when you walk along the beach and you see a whole lot of um, dog tracks, you've seen where dogs go running. It's the same thing as when we're out here. So we can tell a leopard track because it looks like a very big cat that's been walking along the beach. Or we can tell an impala because it looks like a very small cow, if you like. So, now, like I say, the wind has been blowing a bit. Dave, can you see down here? That there, everybody, is the track of an impala. And it's just that little bit there. And what it is, I'm going to draw you a big version of it in the sand, and then you'll know. It looks like that, and there's a m middle thing like that, and it looks like that. Okay. Now, just about all the herbivores out here, like the impala and the nyala and the kudu and the buffalo and the wildebeest and the waterbuck, They've all got the same kind of foot, it's just a slightly different shape. And you have to learn the different shapes if you want to track them. The other thing you can use to track an animal, of course, is this. And this is the dung. And dung, well, it's, it's, uh, I know that to many of you who think of picking up dung, you must think that's very disgusting indeed. But it isn't, because this is grass. It's just processed grass. And it's come through the impala's digestive system. And there it is. Now, one day, you're all going to learn about something called the Great Trek.
And the great trek, apart from being an enormous South African myth, was also a time when the people moving through the country, they got very bored and they didn't have games like you have to play at home, so they had to make games up for themselves. And one of the games they learned to play was something called Bok Droll Spuch. All say that together on the count of three. One, two, three. Bok Droll Spuch. And that means goat dropping spitting. And what you do is you put it into your mouth. Are you ready? And you see how far you can spit it. Are you ready, Dave? Here we go. Yes. And that was the game that they used to play on the Great Trek. Right, there we are. Let's get back in the car. Now, don't do that um, in, if you go into the wild, unless you know exactly what animal's dung you've been looking at. And also, you must make sure it's old, like that one was. It was very dry, which means it doesn't taste of anything. Bok, droll, spuch. All right, girls, I'm going to carry on looking for this leopard. I'm going to hand you back to Jamie. I hope you have a lovely day. Oh, everybody, hold on. This is a little bit of a bumpy stretch along this patch of road. Before we come to the end of our safari, I'm really hoping, fingers crossed, that we can find you a nice view of the elephants. Now, I bet you something I've got to try when I get home. I'm going to challenge James Hendry to a Bokdrol Spuch competition to see which of us can spit the Bokdrol a little bit further than the other. I'm pretty sure that... I think James will probably win. James will definitely win. I'm actually really bad at that game. The elephants are just hidden away in the bushes off to my left. And I think, unfortunately, they're going to stay hidden. Because it's so windy, like our elephants that we saw first, they're a bit nervous and also they just want to be somewhere where they feel safe. And that goes for all of the animals. They're hiding away behind the trees. Now, Madison, on a different tack entirely, you were wondering if I've seen any hyena today. The answer is no, I haven't, but I'm really, really looking hard for them, Madison. So I told you, I think I told you, when I came to visit, that the hyenas have a little den site where they keep their brand new baby cubs, and one of them has just had two new babies. So we don't know exactly where they're hiding at the moment, but I am looking for them. And hopefully, next time you come on safari with us, we'll be able to show you them. Because the spotted hyena is one of my absolute favorite animals. They're really, really smart, really clever, and very interesting, especially the babies that are always up to mischief. Sometimes they even come and chew on our tires while we're sitting watching them. Our elephants don't want to be seen today. I think they're feeling shy. They're all hidden away where we can't go and see them. Well, you never know. There could be an elephant around the next corner, but I don't think we're going to get to see the elephants that we were looking for. That's okay. It's not a zoo. It's a wild animal. And sometimes we just have, or all the time, we just have to do what the animals let us do. Well, the next time you come on safari, hopefully you will be able to see something like a leopard, but elephant, wonderful buffalo, wonderful, and you even want to seek a few <laughs> Yay! Okay, up we go. Thank you, big to Brian and thank you to the thumb. Give the thumb a round of applause everybody. A wonderful day at school and we will catch up with you some other time on safari. Bye bye everybody.